All right, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to start the three thirty session. Uh, we're going to be talking about some blockchain stuff, uh, a, a current uh, continuous theme of, at this event. My name is Keith Ammon. I'm one of the many state representatives here in New Hampshire. Uh, I'm in my fourth term, so I've been in the state house uh, a total of eight years combined. And uh, we'll pass it on. Hello there. My name is Isaac Fithian. Um, all opinions here are my own, but I, I work for a uh, publicly traded Bitcoin mining company called Cathedra Bitcoin Incorporated. Uh, I started off uh, you know, back in 2016 with a pile of old computer parts on my kitchen table, and uh, the parts have just gotten more complicated. The wires have kept getting bigger. Uh, so i have uh, just an organic, uh, you know, self-taught Bitcoin miner and now working on, uh, on big farms. Hey, I'm Joel Valenzuela. I've been um, I'm a free state project mover. I've been living on crypto f- since 2015, and I work for Dash currently. Very cool. So Joel's going to tell us about how uh, living off of crypto is uh, you know, not only possible, but he's done it for a long time. But before we get into that, um, I just wanted to talk about, um, you know, this is, this is a, a free state project event, and uh, it has the word state in the title of the uh, of the project, right? So, uh, New Hampshire was the state that was chosen, and so my my one of my efforts in the legislature has been focusing on how can we make New Hampshire uh, friendly to the blockchain industry at large. Um, and so, I think we first started talking about uh, Bitcoin back in the day in, in 2015 in the legislature, and uh, I think the uh, the rainy day fund for the state was 93 million dollars. And I did some math, you know, if we, if we put just 5% of that into Bitcoin at the time, we'd have like half a billion dollars from that tiny 5%, and we could have paid off some of the, uh, the, the pension costs that the state has. So, you know, looking back is 2020, but um, we're working on, uh, I guess I could start in 2017, we put in a bill to exempt Bitcoin transactions from our state's money transmitter laws. And uh, we were the first state to do that. We we actually beat Wyoming uh, to passing any kind of crypto legislation. And we learned some things from that. Um, uh, what we learned was that companies in the, in the marketplace, good actors in the marketplace, were kind of unsure because we had no rules. They, they weren't used to a state not having rules. So, and I, I kind of... Uh, <laughs> I kind of learned from that experience. So in the, in the intervening time, we've put in some additional legislation. Um, you know, we, we have a, our state securities laws now exempts uh, tokens with a, um, a consumptive purpose. So a particular type of token is exempted from our securities laws. Um, we enacted something called the Uniform Commercial Code, Article 12, uh, the 2022 Amendments, that talk all about some basic rules of the road for digital assets. Um, and we're working now on uh, legislation. We had a, a talk earlier on DAOs. We're working on uh, legal personhood for DAOs. That, that last bill came out of uh, Governor Sununu signing an executive order, I think in early 2022 is when he signed it. It created a commission on cryptocurrency and digital assets. And there was a, a year almost a year long commission that we spent. I, I was appointed by the house to serve on that commission. And we worked with our different state agencies, um, different experts in the field. And uh, we, we, you know, had a lot of input on what can New Hampshire do to be at the forefront of this new, uh, you know, financial technology innovation. And we came to the conclusion that um, our energy prices are, are, too exorbitant. So we're not going to have a lot of mining like they do in states that have a lot of cheap energy like uh, Midwest or Texas. Um, so, But we can do things innovative in the financial and legal field. So um, you may not know, New Hampshire had the first was the first state to have a credit union. So we kind of invented uh, credit unions. And uh, about, about a dozen or so years ago, maybe a little longer, we revamped our entire trust laws so that um, trust, trusts and trust companies uh, are protected by the state of New Hampshire. And that was a big innovation. And we, we were ahead of most other states. 
and I think we had the first state lottery is another uh, interesting innovation. So, you know, we realized that New Hampshire has been at the cutting edge of a lot of things that have been you know, taken off and uh, grown legs in other states and that focusing on the legal aspects of it. Um, and that's where the idea for the Dow bill came from. It came from the governor's commission. Uh, and so I've been working maybe the last year or so to get that through the legislature. It passed the full house a couple of weeks ago. So we, I introduced it a year ago and it, we worked on it over the summer. Um, and it passed, it passed the full house, something like 340 something to 30 something. So by a large bipartisan majority, it's one of the reasons I like this issue because it is bipartisan. Um, and we want to, I think I mentioned in a talk yesterday, we want to make New Hampshire the lifeboat and a lifeboat needs different things. It needs, you know, energy and currency and defense and, you know, legal protections and second amendment, all those things that we would need to make New Hampshire a secure lifeboat. And I think this is a definitely, uh, a good focus for our efforts in the state house. It does need to stay afloat. <laughs> it's no good at the bottom of the ocean, right? And so I, I'll pass it on to Isaac here. I met Isaac through the governor's commission. Isaac came in to um, advise us on how mining, uh, you know, the energy consumption was a big question about mining. And so Isaac uh, educated our commission on the benefits of Bitcoin mining for the energy grid, which was very interesting. So pass it on. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, uh, you know, one of the big misconceptions out there is, you know, Bitcoin is has the sole focus of a scorch earth policy to consume energy at all costs and, uh, you know, destroy the world. And uh, it's just not not the case. Um, there are, you know, Bitcoin as an industry um, is is one of the most green industries out there. If you actually look at the, you know, by percent of uh, energy used, it, it uses a bunch of hydro, uses a bunch of solar. Um, so it's one of the most green industries that there is, number one. And then number two, um, it's actually doing quite a bit to uh, optimize renewables. So, you know, part of the vision that's been sold with renewables is that we're going to set up these solar panels and set up you know, the, the wind turbines, and these intermittent sources will store energy that we can use later. We'll redistribute it as needed. The problem with that is you need a ton of lithium, you need, you know, with the existing battery technology, there's a host of, you know, engineering going on to make better batteries, but with today's technology, uh, you know, that environmental impact's not being considered at all. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, well, solar panels are zero emission. Well, they're manufactured in China using electricity that's produced with coal. Uh, you know, they're, they're shipped on a boat over here on, a, you know, a tanker that uses oil. Like, there are obviously carbon emissions associated with these things. So um, now I'm not you know, going to sit here and advocate for green energy, but what I am trying to, to point out is that we need to all be honest with ourselves about what it is we're actually trying to sign up for, no matter what we're doing. We just need to have an honest take, and let's just agree on the common objective. Like, let's make a better world together. I, like, and what's the best way to do that? Um, you know, with the, uh, so one of the things that's happening in Texas is uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of the winter storm that happened down there and the whole grid went down. Um, and, you know, en- energy prices skyrocketed. Some people got these ob- obscene bills of you know, multiple thousands of dollars. It was, a, you know, it was a mess. Well, why did that happen? Well, it got cold. People turned on heating devices and the power wasn't there. Um, you know, um, so one of the things that's happening is if you don't have power storage, you are subjecting the, this highly tuned modern miracle I mean, like, you, you flip on a switch, and you don't, like, wait a couple of minutes. It's just on. You know, and that's coming through from thousands of miles away at the exact right voltage. At the, like, like, everything's, like, it's this beautiful engineering project. I won't get into the technicals of the grid, but it, it's this beautiful thing, and it, and it has to work exactly right. Like, it's, a, it's, an in, it's not really a commodity. It's a service. It has to work instantly. And so if all of a sudden that grid is interconnected was something where, oh, a cloud went by and it changed the power going in or the wind, you know, comes and goes, right? You're creating fluctuations and then you need to respond to that to maintain these very, you know, precise conditions for the grid to function as it's intended to. Because if you just have a big power surge, you're going to fry stuff. The grid's not going to work right. So, um, so 
one of the things that, that you can do is store energy. Well, there's problems storing enough energy on grid. The other option is you do something called demand response. And what that consists of is if you have a large user of electricity on the grid and they can adapt quickly enough to changing conditions on the grid, they can load shed. So if you have a device that's running, you turn it off very rapidly you know, in, in proportion to the change on grid, and then you divert that power to customers who need it. So one of the things that's happening in Texas right now is the grid is becoming more stable because when you have these fluctuations, the sun stops shining or you know, gets you know, covered by clouds or the wind stops blowing, Bitcoin miners have uh, in these voluntary programs, they turn off machines basically instantly in some cases. It depends what the unique program is that they're on, but they'll turn off machines and that power can be rediverted to customers. And so... It, it creates a more stable infrastructure base um, for, for any kind of intermitt- intermittency. And it's not just for renewables. You know, there's all sorts of conditions. I mean, what if uh, you know, a power plant goes down? Um, also consider you know, re- removing green energy from the, you know, the thought process entirely. Um, you know, what if a bunch of people decide they want to turn lights on or turn on air conditioners? There's intermittency on the grid whether or not you have green energy. And so that's a problem that has to be dealt with anyway. Traditionally, that's been solved with peaker plants. So you have a rapid startup and, and uh, you know, ramp up and ramp down quickly. That's typically done with natural gas. Um, if you go look at some of these older coal plants uh, or uh, our biomass plants, some of these, like, these are massive turbines to, like, powering you know, millions of people sometimes. It, it can take a couple days to properly ramp those up and down because they're just so big. It's just a massive piece of machinery. So if you have something that takes a couple of days to ramp up and down and a bunch of people are turning on the air conditioners, it's not going to work. So you need to have something that can react to grid, uh, the grid conditions that, that are uh, there's intermittency caused by, you know, green energy uh, is causing some inter- intermittency inherently. You know, the sun doesn't always shine exactly the same way every day. The wind doesn't always blow the same way all the time. There's intermittency there and there's intermittency of the users. And so... Bitcoin can sort of help smooth out these transitions. And what that does is it creates stability. It, it helps, it helps um, you know, you don't have these spikes in the price of grid at those times. So it ends up de-risking it for users. And um, it, here's another thing that's going on. There are uh, many federal subsidies going on with these, um, you know, these green energy programs. And if, if you look at how they work in practice, you know, it's, uh, I, I think many of them are, are well-intentioned, in, but good intentions don't always play out in the way that you'd hope. So uh, if you go into ISO, uh, New, ISO New England's website, they're the grid manager in the area, um, they, uh, they, they list out what the price of electricity is in the area. If, if you look on there, there's times where the price is very low and they'll give you the ratio of usage. Like, oh, we have a, a lot of you know, wind power today on the grid and the, the cost is two cents. That's great. And then there's some days you go on there, it's like, why is there a negative power price? How does that work? Well, what's happening in practice, it, sometimes, this isn't every, every instance, but there are such large government subsidies available for green energy in particular that it is worth it for the green energy providers to bid into the market negatively. And so they're willing to, hey, we'll pay you to take energy from us because then we get, because we're supplying power to the grid, we get the government subsidy. So what ends up happening is you price out some of the other power production. So anyway, Bitcoin can help absorb power in those instances. So instead of bidding negatively, we can use power there as well. So anyway, I that's, can, that's oh, great. Yeah, it's a, it's a very technical discussion. And uh, so the gist of it is, Digital asset mining, Bitcoin mining, can incentivize over capacity, build, build, yes. building out more capacity than we need and absorb the, the differences. And then maybe when we come back to you, we can talk more about mining. But yeah, if let's I can go to Joel for a, one second. A fine, sure. Just a fine point on it. It's, you know, Bitcoin helps smooth out inconsistency on the grid and it creates an abundance of power. And when you create an abundance of something, it tends to lower the price. And so I think Bitcoin is good for the grid. Yeah, so um, it's kind of a good picture of you know where we're at as far as um, the cryptocurrency space has been around for 15 years now, believe it or not. That's that's 
still a new industry, but still a long time at the same time. And um, I really admire the work that um, Keith and some of the others are doing in trying to make sense in a legal sense of these innovations and try to package them into a framework that works in modern society that kind of that works out really well. I mean, especially because, you know, I work for a DAO and it's a kind of a nightmare of like, <laughs> how do you, who's your employer? How do you, where did this come from? All this kind of stuff. If you want to do things in like a like compliant kind of way, it becomes challenging. So I'm glad that we're kind of working on that. Um, but what we have is basically 15 years of innovation, of stuff being built, of technology of potential use cases and just not a lot of use yet and then of course we run into the problems behind that kind of keep things from being adopted in a very mass scale like oh what's the legal framework for this can we is bitcoin mining going to be banned tomorrow and then i don't know if that's going to work anymore my whole business model goes away like there's all that uncertainty trying to be solved and i feel like a lot of us are sort of waiting in this middle space where a lot of people Maybe not me, but a lot of people are sitting around waiting for everything to be solved before they start taking advantage of this, what I call, freedom tech, right? And there's a lot of, um, that makes a lot of sense to a certain extent, right? Unfortunately, this isn't just a, oh, I'll wait until smartphones are standardized before I get one. I'll have my flip phone until, that's fine. The, the challenge with a freedom tech kind of thing uh, is sort of like the same challenge of um, a freedom area like the wonderful free state of new hampshire where you can't wait until they they figure out all the freedom over here and then i'll join the project you know let's wait for them to do all the hard work and figure it out and then i'm just gonna still stay in the you know zombie land of southern california and deal with all that stuff until the world is free here at some point there's a little bit of risk thing in the middle where you might make a move to New Hampshire to experience freedom now, and it's not 100% guaranteed it'll be the libertarian paradise in the next five to ten years, but it's very likely, especially if people take action. And I like to kind of, you know, put that um, allegory onto crypto, where um, in 2013 I got my first Bitcoin when I uh, was traveling through Chicago, and a friend of mine paid me back for his pizza as part of the pizza we shared for lunch in Bitcoin. And that's 2014. I wrote some copywriting stuff for some of the early Bitcoin promotional materials, got paid in Bitcoin. I was really excited. 2014's Liberty Forum, I was giving people, which was also in Nashua. It was in Manchester for a while, but it was also in Nashua. I was giving people rides to the airport, and they were paying me in Bitcoin. I was very excited about that. And then in 2015, at the end, I decided to stop accepting fiat currency for payment just to, like, because I had lifetime, I had flexibility at that point in my life, you know, you know, single, no debt, all that kind of stuff. And I was like, I can take some risks here and try this radical new stuff out, this new technology, this new money out. And since then, I like I haven't looked back. And it, it was it required. It was like a hot. It was a, quite the project at the time. Today, it is not quite the project anymore. It's not that hard to use cryptocurrency in your daily life to a certain extent. And if you want to live entirely off of it, to just not have fiat currency and maybe not even have a bank account for the most part, you can do it and it's it's not that hard. You don't have to be a crazy person like I was when I did it back in the day. So um, I'd like to persuade some people to try some things out, right? Because um, as I'm sure... Anyone who saw uh, Tulsi speak, um, she's getting very worried about the C- coming CBDC regime. A lot of us are. Un- it's not a very specific thing that people are like, oh, this very specific piece of legislation is going to be passed in this thing. As long as we can block that, we're going to be fine. It's still, it's kind of a, a mysterious threat to a certain extent. Like We know what it represents. We know what it encapsulates, but we might not be able to you know, see it specifically coming in time. But more importantly... Every single person who holds dollars and uses a a bank account that you require government approval to have to use your own money, which is everyone in this room, I'm pretty sure, needs government approval to access their money and it can be revoked at any time. Um, Do you really think that people like this are going to have a choice when a CBDC gets rolled out? Just be like, no, I'm going to opt out. It's not that simple. You might 
just say one, one day your bank account or whatever is just, oh, guess what? This is now running on the FedNow settlement system run by the Federal Reserve, and it's all connected to your identity. And if you open a new bank account somewhere else, your identity, CBDC money, whatever, follows you there, and now you're stuck in the system, and that's how you get paid, et cetera. And this becomes a more, uh, a more likely outcome the longer we stay with like 100% part- participation in the fiat and central banking system. If people are in the system... 100%, maybe they, they're grumpy in the legislature here or there. If tons of extra awesome people like Keith get elected, we have a better chance. But the best chance is to start getting out of this system, start having backups before it becomes too late. So um, first off, before, you know, after I wrap up or whatever, in the question and answer period, feel free to just ask me any specific questions. I can answer any specifics that... I know of, and if I don't have an answer, I'll get back to you because I really want people to stop using dollars if they can, right? I really want that to happen eventually. And so um, the first thing is um, there's three major things, and I talked about this this morning, that we're trying to achieve with cryptocurrency. Of course, a lot of us, people have different things. Some people just want to make money, right? Some people just love playing around with weird tech, Some people want one thing but not the other, whatever. But the three big pillars, in my mind at least, of a freedom money are, one, the elements of it, the unit of account, whatever, the supply, cannot be inflated or devalued at a whim by a central party elsewhere. It's kind of like... You know, gold, right? There's or something, some scarce asset. You don't have to worry about the the central government, the Federal Reserve, printing a ton more gold. They can't really do that. It's not really obviously. There's tons of nuance to this. Don't come after me, but you know what I'm saying. So that's number one. Number two, do you have money you own, you control? And so, um, for example, I mean, I'm just pull out some coins. Not that I have to, just to wake you guys up. You know, a couple of these. You put, I possess these in my hand. The only way they can be confiscated from me is if someone like comes and hits me over the head and put up a good fight. You know, <laughs> not for this man. Wait until wait till I pull out a you know some. I don't have. I don't own enough fiat currency to be worth hitting over that. Right. I see your private key written. On yeah. The oh no. But so uh, this is in my personal custody. No one's money in their bank account is in their personal custody. It's in the bank's custody. And if you say, I want to use my money, you have to have their permission to get it out, and they might not. So that's the second pillar is money in your control, your direct control, which cryptocurrency does allow you to have if you hold your own private keys. And then the last thing is to be able to transact irrespective of your identity. And so there's these awful pernicious things called know your customer anti-money laundering laws which basically just in a lot of cases say you need to present id in order to have a bank account or access certain financial services and basically the ability to spend your money outside of that which also includes privately but more importantly just like cash um not cash is not tied to your identity it's just in your possession if i want to pay you here five bucks back for coffee you don't have to be like "Whoa, whoa, whoa let me see some id like no you just which is what you have to do when you use a bank or Venmo or anything else, by the way. But with cash, you just give them money. It's just that easy. These are the things we're trying to accomplish. And I think I'm very confident that pretty much everyone in this room can easily, you know, a little bit of work, but like doable, accomplish the first two very consistently. And the third one, maybe some exceptions, but once in a while you can at least achieve that you know, for a regular purchase, maybe not for your bills, for your bill pay stuff that tends to need that typically, unless you have some other arrangements. But basically I think we can start accomplishing a lot of this, making some, making some income in crypto or taking some income, putting it into that and then spending it and using it and building habits and learning how, you know, kind of like you learn how to, you know, maybe survive off the grid or, you know, chop your own wood or whatever before the electrical grid goes down and it'll be his fault if it does, but just kidding. But, um, <laughs> a problem you, trying to fix. <laughs> yeah, before all that <laughs> happens, but yes, you can start dipping your toes into this world and then increasing it over time until guess what? Before you know it, you don't have to be 
worried about a CBDC coming. You can just, you're already living on freedom money. So I'd encourage everyone to do that at some point, and I'm sure we can follow up later and start talking specifics, but I've rambled enough for this specific chunk of time. I guess I'll go, I'll go next. Thank you, Joel. And uh, I'm interested to hear from Joel specifics on what to do, but before we do that, <laughs> um, so New Hampshire has an interesting place in the current fiat system. Um, we have uh, up in the White Mountains, we have a place called Bretton Woods. And you may have heard of the Bretton Woods Accords, which uh, happened among all of the world powers uh, after World War II. They, they, all the decision makers huddled in New Hampshire uh, and designed the current monetary system, at least up until Nixon shut the gold window a few months before I was born uh, in 71. But so New, New Hampshire, we have a history here of setting, um, you know, the standard for the world. And I think with, with blockchain technology, digital assets, tokenizing assets, as was talked about in an earlier panel, um, we could potentially set up a, uh, a, new, a new world order of, uh, you know, a, a financial, a financial hey, system. So, <laughs> so, um, so I, I think that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I'd like to hear about, um, I know, Isaac, you have some thoughts about, uh, you know, how groundbreaking the invention of Bitcoin was and the, and the reason why it was invented in the first place. And uh, maybe you could elaborate on that in, for a few minutes. Yeah, I, I, think, I think many people come to Bitcoin, come to cryptocurrency, come to blockchain for many different reasons. Um, I think it, it probably would not be difficult to convince the folks in this room that our money, there's a lot of funny business going on with our money, right? Um, <laughs> you know, if I have to walk into a bank and ask to take my money out and they may or may not let me have it, it doesn't quite seem right. Um, if the, I mean, we live in this unique moment, right? Because we all know that our value that we have stored with our time, with our skill, with our dedication, is being eroded away. Do the dollars that represented the value of something we did once is being taken away, not by reducing the units, but by reducing the things that we can buy. There's shrinkflation. Uh, you know, prices are up 40%, which is mysterious since they printed 40% of the monetary supply. It's amazing how that happens. Uh, it, it, the money is sick. And when that happens, the community gets sick. Values that were once ethical are now monetary values. People can be bought and sold. You know, if the if the folks, you know, if money is free speech, which was defined in you know 1976 by the United States Supreme Court, that it represents a form of free speech, then those with the money printer have more free speech than we do, because they get to fund campaigns, they get to lobby, they get to do all these things infinitum. They get to go on and on and on, and, and they push the value that you know, we work hard for. You know, if I go try and print out a dollar, it's called counterfeiting. When they do it, it's called you know, providing a service. Uh, and, and it's incredible because in the, in the Constitution, there is no right to print fiat currencies. In fact, the founders uh, were, had experienced fiat currencies in each of the states. The states had their own fiat currencies prior to the Revolutionary War, and they saw the horrors that happened, uh, like all, all of the, the, these things that happened, right? And so the basis is there in our Constitution. So we've strayed from that. What is the, the mission of Bitcoin? It, it could solve lots of things because the money is sick in many ways, and there's many side effects of that. I think one of the primary ones is the Bitcoin was born out of the 2008 financial crisis, and what we saw is folks take crazy risks with other people's money and then got paid to do that after they lost it all. It was, it's, it's incredible. Um, and so you, know, you cannot trust the folks that hold the keys to the money printer to not just erase the value, erase the, the work you've done in your life. And so... We need to stop people from being, you know, essentially stolen from. Our, our, it's not just us, but like our neighbors are all being stolen from, not by the direct, I mean, 
not by the, uh, the the most consequential thing is that they're just taking they're sucking the value out of the actual basis the touch point of the economy and when you do that you're distorting the signals that allow for creativity for hard work to flourish and, and and make a better society and so that plays out in a host of ways so bitcoin's purpose is let's restore a common touch point so that our economy can thrive again so that way there is a, a true meaning a, a common touchstone on, on on a way of valuing things and uh that, that that's the purpose I, I look at one of the uh you know the um some of the early conversations that were being had about like what is this thing bitcoin what what's it going to be used for uh and it's interesting uh, um reading through some of that how how finney one of the early developers and adopters of bitcoin he he talks about how he had this vision where bitcoin would restore this kind of digitized gold standard and he he foresaw things that uh like a bitcoin backed bank where a bitcoin would denominate the value it's stored in bitcoin and it would still function at, in the, the way that banks used to when they were on the gold standard and I, I think probably what he didn't fully anticipate was the rise of altcoins the rise of of DAOs, the rise of you know all of these other things that, that can be built and so I don't personally want, you know, and this is my own personal opinion. I don't, it's not a company position I have or anything. My personal opinion is we need to have these financial experiments in the world. They need to be, they need to exist somewhere because the reality is there was once a time when the dollar was sound. The dollar was once linked to gold. It was a virtualization of gold. So we had a common touch point, but the virtualization of the gold to allow the economy to thrive. It's been decoupled from gold, and that's the problem. It, it, and so we just can't trust that that system is going to not, you know, wreck us. And so what we have to do is we need to restore that common touch point. The goal is to, to protect my neighbor from having the value. Am, am I the value that I create with my time, with my labor, with my ingenuity? I want to protect that. I want to protect that from my neighbor. And Bitcoin is a way of restoring that. It's a, it's a form of loving your neighbor as yourself. And there's different versions of what success is. Like if everyone is using Bitcoin, you know, the, the whole world's on a Bitcoin standard, is that success? I, I think that for some that is their, their goal and their mission. They would love to see that. And I think there's some merits to that. But I also think that there's going to be some people that they'll never think that way. And let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good because we see these big problems and we think we have solutions for them more passionate you know it's good to be passionate it's good to have conviction but if you push for what you absolutely want what you end up missing out on is other people who could have helped your cause that don't quite agree with you and i think it's better to move somebody from a to b than from a to z in one sitting as long as they're moving in the right direction and the reality is we live in a time where it's evident that this is happening, prices are going up. We live in a, a pretty extraordinary time. There are things that we can point to and say, you can opt out of this insanity. And it, a lot of people have not thought about how bad it is, about what's going on. And so for me, if, we, if, if Bitcoin reaches a point of success where it keeps the dollar accountable again, where they can't just print and print and print and fund wars that we don't consent to. If it's held accountable and it stops the money printer and it, it, it provides a check and balance to that, that would stop our value from being eroded. It would protect our neighbors. So I don't think we need to have everyone on a Bitcoin standard to protect our neighbors. I think that th there, are, there are variants of success here, and we need to think long and hard about how can we win, but it may not be exactly the way you want it to be. Um, Anyway, those are some of my thoughts on that. All right, good thoughts. And Joel, um, you talked about how we all need to learn, have a plan B maybe, um, to learn how to use crypto in our everyday life. Could you give people two or three like, like concrete um, suggestions for how to get started doing that? Yeah, so the first thing, first off, just if anyone wants to volunteer, of course, does anyone here have any cryptocurrency anywhere? Oh, so there, there we go. So that first, 
that first I see a boating accident in the back. Yeah. <laughs> how many? How many of you did have cryptocurrency? But last week, your dog ate your private key back up. <laughs> uh, just a couple of you. Uh, it'll be all of you before I you know. I'm just kidding. But uh, so the first step of just getting some. It's the fa- pretty much everyone here. Most people here have some somewhere of some kind. The good thing is it's easy if you have the wrong one to do this certain purpose. It's easy to swap into the other one. Whatever. There's a, a, a service which um, kind of brings it all home. And for the longest time, so where we were at is anyone can use crypto because it's a permissionless, most, you know, most of them are permissionless networks. Anyone can do, do anything. But as far as where does that plug into the real economy, it's nowhere. You have to literally find someone else who's crazy like you. who's like, oh, I'll take that stuff. That's where we were. One day, it'll be everywhere, everything, etc. In the meantime, there are some intermediaries that have cropped up that make it as if it sort of simulate the end goal today. So one of these things that's cropped up in just the last couple of years is a, a business I'm a big fan of called Spritz Finance or Spritz like an Aperol Spritz. And um, it's a, a bill pay solution with crypto. So you can just add in all of your utility bills and then from crypto you control you don't have to like preload it into like a custodial account or anything but you can just just pay your bill just, and pick one bill right why not electricity right now that we're on the you know keeping on the, the theme you have an electric bill you know a couple hundred bucks a month depending on what you're doing 100 bucks a month i don't know just pay it with crypto every month just start there just try it out be like all right you take your wallet Wherever you have it, you if it's in the phone, you do the little QR code scanner and then hit pay. Or if you copy and paste into your, you know, your desktop wallet, your computer, however you do it, just pay that. And um, Spritz does, is it's the two of the three of those big pillars I was talking about. Where the one pillar it's not is you do have because it's dealing with bills which are in your name, which is you can use to go vote with your utility bills. So it's about as identified to your personhood as you can you do have to give your id to sign up for spreads but then you can just start paying your bills all of them if you want but you start with one and so probably get a recurring acquisition after you try it out a couple times get a recurring acquisition of crypto and for at least that amount that you're going to pay the bill and then just increase it from there that's a good start um, that same company does have like a prepaid like debit card that you can use if you want to just off ramp through that way. There's some things like that, but that's a great first start of like, oh, this is a real world thing that I need to know how to do. And then there you go. Um, there's another good company that I'm a big fan of called Bit Refill, and Bit Refill um, sells mainly like gift cards, like digital gift cards for crypto instantly with no like upcharge. So for example, the other day I was driving home and my wife was like, I want Panera tonight. So I'm like, go order it. And then on my phone with crypto, I bought a Panera gift card for the exact amount that it was going to cost. And I just sent it to her in a text and she plugged it in and there you go. Dinner is covered. Right. And the good thing about that is it's not unlike spritz it's not tied to your identity. So it's like a cash, like it's a digital cash purchase, right? You can, buy an amazon gift card right although you know amazon knows where you live and stuff usually right so that's maybe not perfect but you can buy an amazon gift card plug that in a checkout and you're done you can go to you want a chipotle go do that oh you got some home renovations go to home depot buy a 237 dollar gift card at home depot to cover your outlets your lumber whatever you got etc and then just practice that small interim solution to just okay, look, this is real money in, in my real world. And, of course, the, the rabbit hole beyond that is just pretty endless, but, like, it's like I could, I'd have to do a course on this, right, about, like, well, okay, you can use these services to do this. You can use that, that, that. Oh, this person here, check out this merchant map, but they're not always accurate. Like, all this kind of complicated stuff. Those are the two super easy ones. I'll give you a third one. There's a site I really like called Travala, like travel with an A, Travala. And you can book flights, hotels, rental cars, anything, all in crypto. So if you're like, hey, you know what? I don't travel a lot, but I'm going on vacation. I'm going to Barcelona, let's just say. 
why don't I try to pay for the flight in crypto? Just go to the site, put it in. Oh, yeah, I paid for the flight. And it's it's not like you have to like learn a bunch of weird things to do this. So just like you travel, you pay your bills, and you do like basic cash type purchases. And then this, this is already assuming you already have crypto, which most people do, and you can figure that out. And then there you go. Like, what more do you need, really? That's a great way to get started. That's great. I just want to do a time check here. So we're we're just about ready to wrap up. So I'd like to say just 30 seconds closing remarks, and then we'll take one or two questions, and then you guys are free to go. Um, I'd like to say uh, we're... We're having a success here in New Hampshire. Um, one of the sponsors of this event is one of the largest exchanges in the country. And uh, I was talking to them recently. I won't say their name, but you can look it up because it's not an endorsement. But uh, they were saying recently to me that they looked throughout the country and they looked at New Hampshire's laws. And New Hampshire has some advantages in the laws that we've passed, um, going back to the trust laws that we, we talked about earlier. But then also... Uh, these di- these other digital asset laws that we've passed that we have we're developing a very friendly environment for the industry. Our university systems are getting uh, excited about blockchain activity. That particular sponsor is going to be working with UNH on. Uh, they're actually going to give UNH uh, some funds to work on a project for them, and so that's developing excitement. And so the more that we can make New Hampshire an, an exciting place, you know, for the this, this monetary revolution, this, this digital re- revolution, um, it can feed on itself and uh, we can get out ahead of you know, some of the other states and using our comparative, comparative advantage as what, you know, our, what advantages does our state have. So I, I'm seeing it work out. We, we have exciting, potential exciting movement on, on the Dow front. And uh, I was in on that other panel about real estate, tokenized real estate with a DAO and there's a million questions about it. So it's, it's like the, at the forefront, at the vanguard of, uh, you know, all the things that a DAO could possibly be used for. And, you know, we're, we're kind of in uncharted waters and, uh, but it's also exciting because it's, uh, you know, innovation. Um, so that's my closing remarks. Go New Hampshire. That's, that's, uh, so, and let's uh, go down the line and then we'll take one or two more questions. Go ahead, just oh, wrap it up. Or if you uh, don't want to, you can pass. No, no, I, I, I'm happy to. I just he had a question, so I uh, got stage fright for a moment. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we'll go down. We'll, we'll get to you. Um, I, I guess my closing remark would be: Don't you know? You, you've heard it said, uh, anything worth doing is doing well, and and I think that's true. I think there's another side to that, which is anything worth doing is worth doing poorly. You know, you look at a baby learning to walk for the first time. You wouldn't say, "Oh no, stop! You're messing it up." You have to start somewhere. And so I, I think part of the problem is, you know, we see, you know, there's these amazing tools available today. There, there's all these ways of, you know, you know c- compared to when I first got in, uh, you, you know, into this entire field, uh, there's so many tools now. There's so much development and momentum compared to when, you know, when I, when I first heard about it. And th- th- there's incredible momentum and, um I think that what what we really want is we just want to make a better world, and not not just you know for ourselves but for our neighbors and for our, our family. And you know if you're afraid of trying to scan a QR code and, and just trying, I mean I, I remember my first Bitcoin purchase ever, and I was terrified. Like, am I ever going to see that again? I like I remember feeling and thinking that, and it was palpable. Like I had I was sweaty, I was scared, and the, we can't forget how we started. When it, like we may be passionate, we may be true believers that this can be really good for our neighbors, but our neighbors are where we were when we started. They're scared, and the reality is, if you're like you have to do X, Y, Z, and then you have this monetary free, and like they can't go from A to Z. You're at Z, but it took you a while to get there if you actually remember. And so, what we have to do is we, we need to be passionate. We need to have conviction, but we need to be patient. It, it, it's no different than you know. I've got two young boys, and you know I always try and and remember these are full people that just haven't had as much time as me, and they they can get there, but I have to be patient. I need to bring things to their level, and you know th- there may be wonderful things that I want to do with Bitcoin and to create monetary freedom for myself, my neighbors, and and, and those who come after me. But the reality is, not everyone's going to be there from square one, and so I, I think you know how are we going to make New Hampshire, you know, to answer that question, how do we make New Hampshire the blockchain capital? 
if, if that's possible, it's going to come through patience, conviction, and passion. And I would just encourage you, start. Like, like if you haven't, if, if you believe that this could be a future, for, you know, if you want to opt out to the insanity, start. And it's going to be scary, but there's tons of resources, there's tons of people out there who can help you. And, and just be a voice. You know, I, if you're going to buy something, passively ask, hey, do you want to, you know, when I, when I pay for my, you know, for a haircut or something, like, hey, do you accept Bitcoin? Like, oh, well, you know, you should, you should look into it. You could save a lot on credit card processing fee. Just, like, drop little things like that. You don't have to go on a whole evangelistic tour, but just you're going to live your daily life and just, just be there, be present, and, and show that there's another way. Right, very good. Joe, want to wrap it wrap yeah. up? Yeah. Um, we have the opportunity in our lifetime to separate money and state. And um, freedom money is here today. It's usable. You can use it today. CBDCs are coming. Start living on crypto before it's too late. Very succinct. All right. And gentlemen in the third row, you had your hand up. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really want to part with my crypto. Uh, right. It's Gresham's law, right? We, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good money chases out the bad. Why would you have a depreciating asset? Well, if I'm paying with, yeah, why would I have But that's why I'm the bad money out. Yeah. But then stop getting bad money. <laughs> if So one one. One idea is, uh, you know, replenish what you spend. Because um, if you did that in Bitcoin eight years ago, you'd be kicking yourself, right? Like, <laughs> if you didn't replenish what you spent, you know, so um, you're sort of you're sort of contributing to like bootstrapping this economy by doing that. You know, um, I'm sorry, Dan, right behind you. Thank you. Yeah, um, I'm curious. You've mentioned a couple of times. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the question is, like, why would they allow that? Maybe they won't. That's why the more we try to extricate ourselves from the system, the better. The thing is, if 100% of people are paid in fiat currency, in dollars, whatever, and when they flip to CBDCs and they try to say, if, like, half a percent of people then try to, like, buy Bitcoin or whatever, or buy any cryptocurrency or whatever, it's easy to smash those people and just say, you can't. And I know a lot of people have had a lot of bank accounts shut down because their bank learns that they're using it for crypto and they're just like, we don't want to deal with that. But if 30% of the population is just dumping it right into crypto, those people are going to freak out if they're prevented from doing that and they're at least going to go to the polls, if not you know, go to the streets at that point. It's so much harder if there's like a mob of people kind of using this. And hopefully also if... A company's like, hey, a third of my employees are uh, converting their paycheck instantly to crypto. Why don't we just pay them directly in crypto? And then all of a sudden, it's you don't need these go-betweens as much. You have There are lots of companies out there that pay directly in crypto. I've been paid by a few different companies over the course of my life in directly in crypto. And I do pay all my contractors, everyone under me. They all get paid directly in crypto. So... Uh-huh. This is where it kind of goes. It, I think we can make it so happen. We're getting the hook. Um, Dan, do you have a 10 second question in the front row? Uh, New Hampshire tragically has the highest electricity costs in the <laughs> lower 48. What is your break even wholesale kilowatt hour price reminder? Do you have that? Yeah. Uh, it, it, in the state of New Hampshire? In general, it probably fluctuates, I'd guess. On the yeah, point. I mean, uh, it, so it really depends on the efficiency of, of the machine that you have. Yeah, so. Um, we we have so we have uh, so we're we're yeah in my professional capacity we have several data centers that all have very different electric rates and so 
Um, in, in our company, what we've done is we've employed uh, some specialized firmware. So we actually don't run them at stock. So whatever nameplate setting you'd see on an ASIC that's available on the market, uh, we're breaking the rules. <laughs> um, so to give you an example, and, and we've, you know, I'm allowed to talk about this because we push publish stuff about it, but you know, you have a the S19J Pro is a 30 joule per terahash machine. We've employed ther- um, firmware to be able to get below 23 joules a terahash. And so that changes the break-even hash rate, uh, uh, sorry, the break-even profitability for the electric rate, but you'll get to make more profit, but you have less gross. So it changes. So you guys should talk offline. Um, Cathedra <laughs> just, you guys just got acquired or you, you uh, merged with another mining company and, uh, where can they go to find out more about that? Uh, you can go to cathedral.com. It's like cathedral, but without an L. C-A-T-H-E-D-R-A. And then, Joel, where can people go to find more about you? Um, you can go to, I'm on Twitter a lot, at the desert links. Not Like desert is in dry place, links is in kitty cat. Um, that's where you can find most of my stuff. I have the same handle a lot of places. Um, also, if you want to go to dash.org, that's a project I'm working for right now. It's a great, probably the easiest, fastest, cheapest, spendable crypto out there. So even if you like end up migrating to other ones, that's a great place to start and get spoiled by a good user experience and then you know go on to other things. And then if you last thing, if you look up Digital Cash Network, that's the podcast I do. And so that's on the side. And so great for some interesting spicy takes some education, all that kind of stuff. All right, great. And then I'm rep REP Keith Ammon at, on Twitter. You can find me on there. All right. Thank you, everybody. Um, we'll get ready for the next panel. Thank you, guys. Thank you.